Kim, hey, we're doing this in person. We are. Finally. So I'm so excited. Oh, me too. I'm super grateful you're uh, able to make time on this Sunday mm -hmm. uh, with your kids and your practice that you're able to carve out some time for me and the show, and I'm really grateful for that. I've had, kind of the reason why we're here is I've had multiple people, whether after the show or during like their show, bring up you, <laughs> right? Whether it be in the form of like, oh man, like she does all these crazy cool things, really, really, really smart women, woman, like all these cool people that I think are really interesting and fascinating uh -huh. are saying that about you. I'm That's saying neat. what I think about them, but about you. And yep. so now we're here. Now we're here. Right on. So take me through kind of, we'll start kind of your journey, like uh, post-secondary, kind okay. of take us from there to how we ended up here, and we'll, we'll start there. Okay, so uh, I grew up in Elliott Lake, so I went to the high school called ELSS, and uh, the thing I remember the most, now I'm going to date myself here, we had grade 13, so I went to so, OAC, yeah. and uh, in my fifth year of high school, I remember all my friends going around going, well, I'm going to go to Queens, and I'm going to take law, and I'm going to go to yeah. U of T, and I'm going to take medicine, and I'm like, I remember in that year going, oh, that's a good idea. Oh, that's, oh, I'm jealous about that, you know. Yeah. And and everyone having these really big, glorious um, ideas and goals and dreams. And then I was like going, hmm, I don't know what I want to do. Yeah. And so I went to Laurentian and I took, um, back then it was your human kinetics still, but it was more exercise physiology. Now okay. it's kinesiology. Yeah. And um, I knew I knew that I wanted something in the healthcare field, but I had no clue what. So I spent my four years doing kin, mm -hmm. and um, at the end of that, I still had no idea. I didn't know if I wanted medicine. I didn't know if I wanted physio or any of the rest of it. So mm -hmm. um, after my fourth year, I took a year off, and I moved to Kitchener. Oh, nice. And I was lucky enough to work in this really neat strip mall and half of it was a physiotherapy clinic and half of it was a sports medicine clinic. Oh, cool. And coming from a small city, I didn't know what sports medicine was exactly. Mm -hmm. I did have the um, privilege of working with Wendy Hampson at Laurentian University and anybody that went through Laurentian would remember Wendy. She was an athletic therapist at Laurentian for, I'm going to say 40 years probably. Oh, geez. Good for um, yeah, wow. and she was a mentor to many, many, many people. And so I started my time in Kitchener in the physio side. And as interesting as it was, it was um, not really my, kind of like my soulmate. It was medicine and it was education and um, it had that gratitude factor and people mm. were coming and going. Um, but there was still something lacking in the entire environment. Yeah. And then I went to the sports medicine side. And let me tell you. Now we're talking. <laughs> now we're talking. So we had the women's Olympic softball team okay. coming through. And they were strong women and they were oh, big yeah. women. And imagine. they were powerful women. Amazing. And this sports guy was just, they were hooting and hollering. And the music was playing or the TVs mm. were on. And someone was screaming. And I remember going, oh, what is this place? Yeah. But the interesting thing was the athletic therapist there he knew about them, he knew what sport, and he, he had this really interesting way about going about their their treatments according to what they were, that was coming up, right? So mm -hmm. when I was on the other side, it wasn't like, okay, so you're going to drive to Toronto on Friday, so we're going to adjust your treatments according to what's happening in the week, but this guy did. So he would ask the women, or whoever was in there for that matter, yeah. you know, um, the uh, OHL team came through there as well, and it was like, so you're going to play a game, your, your game's on Saturdays, so you know, you're going to eat like this, this is how you're going to taper, this is what your workout's going to look like. And, and it, he sat Whoa. back and went, wow, there's a lot up there, if I could just take that head and do this. Yeah, right? okay. And um, so that was, that, was the, that, was, that was the point for me, it was right then and there when I realized that they, the environment was loud and energetic and positive and it was just, I found that the people healed well there was a trust but there was a familial perspective yeah. and everybody knew him by name and and it was just a really good environment to expect and to evoke the healing process so mm -hmm. right after that i applied to sheridan in oakville and i got in and spent uh three great years with a you know great group of 
of people and they're all over the place i've got one with the national ballet oh, wow. all the way through to the nhl so my <laughs> my, really... my my classmates were pretty um pretty talented and um i was coming back to sudbury mm -hmm. so in my last year at sheridan um i also took my acupuncture mm -hmm. and i also started osteopathy which um was by a um, physician out of France named uh, Guy Voyer. So pretty, pretty cool stuff there. I don't practice the osteo stuff very often, but I do still steal some of the, yeah. some of the techniques. Just to apply what you do mm -hmm. on a day-to-day. -day. Nice. And just because I do things quickly, right? So the recovery piece is a little yeah. faster. And uh, yeah, so in my last year, I would come home on Fridays and I was getting my clinic ready. I hadn't even written my exam yet. No. Every Friday I'm meeting with a bank or a landlord or something and I was prepping and then I remember one day going, oh shit, I hope I pass. Like, oh yeah, <laughs> I gotta study for this thing. <laughs> I'm like, oh shit, I'm, I'm opening on this day, six weeks before is my exam, like, I hope uh, I pass. That's and, close too, oh, yeah. six weeks? Oh yeah. Oh, geez. And no you know, like the present, though. knock on wood, um, everything went well, passed and uh, I started my clinic in on August 6, 2000. Nice. Yep. It's been onwards and upwards ever yep. since. Yep. That's so cool. Did you always know you wanted to create that environment that you really enjoyed? Yes. As you kind of grew up? No, in no. That's the interesting thing. Um, I didn't, It's and, and this is probably more, you know, directed to people who um, don't know what they want to do, this comment here. Mm -hmm. There is a lot about myself that I know now. Yeah. that I didn't know existed inside of me then. And I know that sounds yeah. a little corny, but it's actually very true. I didn't yeah. realize a lot about my character um, when I was younger. I had no idea. And mm -hmm. as you get older and you realize how tough you are and, and how motivated you can be and how you can persevere and all yeah. these other things, um, you just don't know them when you're younger, right? Yeah. So I've learned a lot about myself in these, in these processes and these uh, experiences. And um, so no, I actually didn't know any of that before. Jeez, when did you kind of, once you kind of experienced that environment, right at the clinic, mm -hmm. you wanted to from there kind of create that? You're like, I want this for my, like, yes. I want to be well, that hat that people can. Yeah, and who, who doesn't want to go to work where it's loud and laughter and people are high-fiving yeah, on the way Yeah, it's a good energy. It's a great energy, yeah. right? And so many people have a job where they're like, oh, it's Monday. Oh, thank God, it's Friday at five, right? And I'm the opposite. Yeah. One of my favorite places on earth is work. I get to go to one of my favorite places every single day and see some of the most amazing humans. So for me, my work environment is awesome. Yeah. So you know when I, right? So yeah. when I first started, I didn't have TVs in the room. Um, I, I introduced those um, probably about 10 years ago. And uh, it just gives people something to do. And it gives us a topic to talk about. Mm -hmm. So they'll either be curling on or the Olympics on or an NHL team uh, on the guy side. Yeah, okay. So no in my news. facility, instead of doing a whole bunch of curtains, I have, excuse me, four beds on one side for women. Mm -hmm. And their space is designed a little bit prettier. And then my guy's side looks like a basement, uh, kind of like a man cave. So I've got concrete, yeah, exactly, <laughs> concrete walls. I've got hockey jerseys nice, up everywhere. Yeah. So yeah, so the guy's side typically has sports and the girl's side typically has like HGTV yeah. kind of things. Nice. Like. But it gives us, it just, it, you know, it opens up conversations if things are going on. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it's one of our local NHL guys that, yeah. you know, like, Marcus, who did a Superman punch and missed, and so it opens up for a lot of topics. The conversation. Yeah, I saw that. I was like, oh no. Oh, yeah, I was like, he bailed oh, off Marcus. the ice pretty hard after that. Yeah. Like you just go yeah. off, like all right, right. You know, he knew what it was. Gotta love him, but yeah. yeah so it's um, the environment. We're always laughing, um, and yeah, the it just gives us, you know, something to do, and and um, just the environment in itself is just a really cool place to be. Yeah, and I think that helps people. You don't want to see me, right? You don't want to be in pain and have to That's call a good point. Kim. That's a good point. Right? Yeah. So if you're calling me, you're pretty sore. Yeah. And, uh, Walking is not easy for uh -huh. you, no. <laughs> so if I can lighten that anxiety and that, that pressure a little bit by the mm -hmm. environment, then they're coming into a setting that they'll heal from. Mm -hmm. Right? Interesting. So. It feels like, just from what I hear and what talking to you, I feel as if you're creating, like there's a very cool connection that's formed, right? Yep. Through you and your clients and yep. you and like your staff and stuff. Yep. Is that how you go about that? Like it sounds like when you create the, like the environment for the women, environment for the men, like what else do you do that kind of allows that connection to form? 
with clients. We um, we joke a lot. We harass our patients quite a bit in a in a fun and, course, and uh, you know safe way. But um, right from the time they come in and they see Ant at the desk, mm -hmm. she usually she's my you know my Italian bulldog, so she'll harass them a little bit. Nice. And um, we we form relationships very very quickly, and um, it's just a really light hearted place, and mm -hmm. we make sure that. And I work beside Mike. Yeah. So Mike's in, Mike. in my rooms. Yeah. And so, you know, some, and we're always talking. So always talking, always, always teaching, always chatting. Yeah. So people will take some of that information. And Mike has these really neat, we call them Mike-isms. And they're these no little, way. oh yeah. There's a thing? Oh, oh I it, wish is. I knew. it is, it oh. is. So he tells one patient the other day, and he, sometimes you don't even realize someone's listening to you, right? So <laughs> he's trying to stretch them and he's like, it's like be you're like bending a Buick. So I'm like three beds over and I start laughing my ass off. I'm like, that's the best comment I think I've ever heard. So I'm like, what does that mean exactly? He's like, I can't, I can't bend him. Like he's like, he's like a Buick. I've used it like three or four times with patients. <laughs> so it's, it's those kinds of, you know, kind of conversations <laughs> we on. have. Yeah. Yeah. That we have there. And the guy, so the guy's laugh. He's like, not okay, wrong. so I'm not flexible. Yeah, right. You can't bend a Buick. No, no. So oh, yeah, so it's just it's just a lot of back and forth and laughter and that's I think our personality. So everybody that works under my like under my roof or in my facility, mm -hmm. um, we have very similar values and very very similar um, personalities. Yeah. So it's a, it's you know and I think that helps people feel comfortable, and then when they feel comfortable, they feel um, confident about their practitioner, and when it's a light-hearted kind of environment. They're very comforted very quickly, and when you can right. settle somebody's sympathetic nervous system, meaning their fight or flight, yeah. or their anxiety, or their stress from the day, and you bring them in, and then they're sitting mm. and they're like, "Okay, I like this place. These guys are pretty funny." Or I get to watch TV for an hour, and I don't have my kids, so nobody, you know. And <clears throat> when you start, you know, you, they start to kind of settle <laughs> into their place, yeah. and then it's like, like this, and then their body's yeah. ready to to recover. That's awesome. <clears throat> How important is that aspect in the prep in the preparing them to go through the injury process like the recovery process i right? th i think it's incredibly important i think that um medical models or therapeutic models where your your treatments are quick and yes you may be doing something physiologically for them but I think the before piece mm -hmm. is just as important as that piece. So when we work on somebody, we have heat, we get them settled in. Because the other thing too is everybody's busy. Everybody, our Every moms, our dads, yeah. our brothers, our sisters, everybody's busy. Yeah. So when they're trying to fit in an hour of treatment in their day, they're excuse me, running there, they're parking, they're running in, hoping they're not late. Now we got all the COVID screens, so they got to do all that stuff, right? Mm. And then you're getting them into the bed, and if the next thing is diving right into the treatment, you, your expectations are going to be a little too high and thinking that yeah. they're just going to calm enough for you to go at it. Never happens. Never. They're up here, you got to bring them you down. Got it's it. too much of a jump. So yeah. now their sympathetic nervous system and their fight or flight is firing, right. and we want to, and we want to, when we work, we need to work in their parasympathetic, which is their just their calming system. Mm -hmm. And in order to, to be here, I got to bring them down. Yeah. So our treatments are longer. They they have 20 minutes where there's a heat pack on them. They're comfortable. They're warm. Mm -hmm. um, we have a machine called the interferential current. That's prepping the site. So there's a purpose for everything that we do there. Right. And the first 15, 20 minutes, yes, it's to calm them, get their nervous system settled, anxiety, whatever. Get their day finished or at least whatever they were kind of struggling or, yeah. you know, even just being in a rush. Think of just going to a meeting and yeah. you sit there for a minute and you're like, okay, now I'm ready, right? Getting that off, uh, you know, off mm. the table. And then after that, then we take the next 40 minutes and we mm. do the treatment. So I personally yeah. think it's incredibly important if you want to create a change in that person yeah. you need them ready to do so so i think it's incredibly important okay i that's interesting that it's not a um because i know having um and you have a chiropractor as well i don't that's about no? the only thing okay. i don't have um not because i don't believe in right. them not i have um dr cannell was with me for a few years um we just we just never really put another one back in so i'm hoping to have one again nice yeah what i was wondering um I know they have a weird, um, like there's a misconception people have with it, man, I need a chiropractor just to like crack me a bunch. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is, 
there. Like it always seems like that's something that like they're always separate in the recovery process, at least from what I've seen, mm -hmm. like they're separate doing their thing. And then there's groups of clinics. Right. Oh, that's things. an interesting, yeah. that's an interesting, um, concept actually. Um, now chiropractors are probably one of the strongest diagnosticians mm -hmm. in the allied paramedic world. Yeah. Um, they are spectacular in the neuro and, um, obviously in the spine. And as we know, that's, you know, a cause of a lot of problems. Right. Um, doctor they're also doctors of chiropractics right so they they are typically seen um a, a little higher we'll say in the food chain um and they work really well with massage therapy when you have um a multi multidisciplinary clinics are very very hard to do well um i've been grateful with mm. the fact that mine is run yeah. very smoothly um but that's also because i allow all my practitioners to run their own piece. I don't micromanage. So, Huge. yeah. Huge. So sometimes what happens is a chiropractor will own the facility or will be the lead practitioner and then everybody runs out underneath them. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of turnover in facilities that are run that way because yeah. everyone's competing for that lead role. Right. If you're in that if you're in some sort of allied or paramedical profession, chances are you're a type A personality and mm -hmm. you're a go-getter. The other thing that happens is in the multidisciplinary facilities, a lot of times they'll be like, well, I could do this on my own and mm. pay less rent or pay less to the owner. I don't need these people to mm. do my work because I've already done my schooling. Uh, so a lot of times you get them broken up and, and, and people go on their way and start. And that's in dentistry, that's in optometry, mm -hmm. that's in anything, right? Yeah, that's true. And, and it does, and, and you can, by all rights, you can. But where the, the connection and that multidisciplinary approach benefits is the patient because it's like a one-stop shop. So if I can't figure it out, I can send them to physio. If mm -hmm. physio's like, I don't do enough manual work, mm -hmm. but they need a really deep massage, I've got three RMTs, yeah. right? And so on and so forth. So their care stays within the trusted circle of care, which is in yeah. one building. So Easy. I don't, Easier. you know, so I, of course not being a Kyra, I don't really know um, where that kind of break is, but yeah. you're right, I have noticed that they typically do yeah. run facilities on their own. Um, but I'm assuming it's probably mostly because they're they're just higher and, and, and better educated on diagnosing neurological issues. Interesting. Yeah, that's why I was wondering. It's like, yeah. Well, it's separate, so. Yeah. But, okay. Um, so this, um, when we first started talking, um, like over FaceTime a couple weeks ago, mm -hmm. kind of break the ice and stuff, um, we went on a long conversation about this kind of generation of athletes mm -hmm. right yeah and so i mean like the athletes that we have as mutual friends or people out there even that we don't know or that i don't know maybe personally but you do yeah um seeing the things they're accomplishing at the levels they're accomplishing it at and yeah. at first glance they don't look like they can accomplish those things, mm -hmm. right? They're not like Michael B. Jordan physiques or anything, right? So you're like, oh, at first glance, you're kind of confused. Now, why is that? Like, why do you think those, like that generation of athlete is kind of starting to take a uphill? I think there's two things you can, you can attribute that to. Yeah. I think it's the Spartan world now that we have these races that combine, um, um, the running and all the obstacles and yeah. I think the David Goggins worlds can be thanked for that as well yeah. um, For those of you who don't know look him up pretty impressive man um, and I think the generation is and podcasts yeah Right, so people are Easy learning a lot of bits of information and they don't have to read a full book Yeah, which is right kind of a shame. <clears throat> yeah but, but sometimes it's enough it. to get them interested in the book. Mm -hmm. um, but I think those are the factors that are creating, and, and you know, I don't know if you know Skyler who just ran across no Canada. No, yeah, okay. I don't know him So he's a good one too, yeah. just so we don't call out any locals. Um, so if you look at what Skyler accomplished, he ran, it's got to be close to 6,000 kilometers. Far. And he Far ran distance. around 63 kilometers a day for 160 days. Ugh. So let's all think about that for a second. That's a marathon and a half every single day. For Rain, shine, snow, whatever, right across Canada for mental 
health. Yeah. <clears throat> Amazing. It's amazing. Amazing, yeah. So I think what's happening is people are seeing that the physical and mental limitations that they were putting on themselves mm -hmm. were just that. They were their own belief systems. Yeah. And I think the David Goggins and the Spartan races and the Skylers of the world have made people realize that your physical capabilities far exceed what you think they do. Mm -hmm. And you can pull this stuff off. Yeah. And, you know, the harm versus the hurt. And am I, am I hurting or is it hurt? And all those, yeah. all those things, I think people are listening to podcasts more. They're reading a bit more, but they're reading things that are motivational. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's come to light, obviously, is mental health. Right. And um, a lot of people are doing these physical um, races and, and sports and, and just goals and mm -hmm. things like Skylar um, because of their own mental health. Yeah. <clears throat> and ah, they're they're putting these yeah. really big goals and they're and they're succeeding. Oh, for sure. Right? Yeah. And they're showing Amazing. people through their battles yeah. what they can accomplish to help motivate someone else battling Crazy. the same thing. Yeah. And before, I think mental health was just as we know, was hidden, but people didn't know to go out and say, and Skylar's one of them, look what I can accomplish with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So, right? And, super and I, cool, yeah. yeah, it is super cool. Yeah, and very... like the ones we've spoken about that, that we both know, and, and that's what they're doing. Yeah. They're doing like insane amounts of, of it's crazy mileage, we'll say, yeah. um, um, for, for themselves, yeah. but just to prove it can be done. And mm -hmm. so, and, and you got the, you know, the social media platform where, where without it, no one would know. Like, think about Terry Fox yeah. for a minute. Like, think of what he accomplished in a time with no social media. No Instagram. <laughs> right? No, like, well, maybe, no, no Facebook. No Facebook. Um, so nothing. you had a few, somebody with maybe like an old camera that took the odd picture and maybe some old video footage. Oh, crazy. And, and now you've got Skylar who reached people all over the world um, with Instagram and Facebook mm. and these other, and these posts. Just the and, story, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think um, there might have been a lot more people that did things that we don't know about because we didn't have a social media platform yeah. to watch. No, true. So we For know sure. Terry Fox because Terry Fox was a very well-known yeah. Canadian. Um, but there could be thousands of Terry Foxes out there that mm -hmm. we don't know about from, so you know, cool the 70s too. and 80s and 90s before mm -hmm. all this stuff came out. So um, now we're just aware of it. Yeah. So I think I think that in part and parcel is why we're seeing this more often. So with that being said, and you touched on it briefly with, it's a lot of mileage. It's a lot said, of mileage. Right? It's a lot of moving in one direction and it's a lot of, oh, it's just so consistent, right? I like just, I'm trying to wrap my head around the sheer quantity of doing something mm -hmm. like that. And I haven't been able to <laughs> yet. We'll see. But with that, and you have um, those people going in and doing therapy with mm -hmm. you and your yep. team. Yeah. What is your approach to the industry? Uh, sorry, to the injury prevention aspect of that, right? Because it's not just right. about building them up That's to right. be strong. That's right. To peak, because they're not peaking. It's every single day, Correct. right? You have to also let them build and get stronger. That's right. But still prevent. Yep. For the yeah. things. It's How a very, it's a very different um, protocol. Because normally, mm -hmm. when you have a, a team, let's say a football player, mm -hmm. you divide your week into days, right? <laughs> like I kind of like what I was saying when I was first um, worked with the sports medicine guys yeah. and realized that they did that division. So when you're working with a team and they've got a game, let's say my Sudbury Wolves or my Sudbury Five, we'll go local, mm -hmm. nice. and they play. Let's say they play Friday night, mm -hmm. and I've got an injury from the weekend. Mm -hmm. And they come see me on the Monday and it's like, okay, so I have Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday to Thursday. Mm -hmm. That's all I've got because Friday's game day. So mm -hmm. what I would treat on Friday is very different. So I would treat the trauma mm -hmm. site very early in the week and then we try to stabilize it because you're only mm -hmm. going to get so much healing done yeah. in three days. Right. And so what we do is more of a management program in that sense, right? Mm -hmm. So we're like, okay, well, we're, you're not going to be 100% in three days. We know that. No. But we can tape it. We can brace it. We can prep you for it, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And all those things happen. Now you get a Skyler or somebody who's doing 63 or 65 kilometers every single day. Every day for a long time. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so you're not going to get any healing at all. You're hoping that... 
their sleep, their hydration, and their fuel is taken care of, which we do talk about. Yeah. Right? And by the time he got to me, like Skylar, for example, um, he had already run from BC. So, yeah, I kind of had that stuff figured out, yeah, right? Yeah, I kind of understood. The, yeah. Yeah. And, and then you've got your environment, you've got the weather, you've got all these other things. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he sleep, you know, some of these guys are sleeping in hotels and they're just, so there's, there's so many variables. So first what we do is figure out what the variables are mm-hmm. and which ones we can tweak. So when I got Skylar, I got him literally halfway through. Yep. And so you don't want to change too much because he's in a pattern. Mm-hmm. So because there's a pattern and the pattern's working, you don't want to influence it too much. Right. But you do want to improve the little things that he may not have known about, mm-hmm. may not have thought about, all those little things. So there is an education piece. Yeah. But you can't you can't over over inundate them because it might it could be like going, Ooh, I wouldn't have done that for the last thirty days. Too bad. He's been doing it and mm-hmm. you can't change it. But the things that you can influence and change and modify without screwing too many things up, yeah. you do. So sometimes it's like, okay, we're going to change the time you take your salt water. We're going to um, change the order of your meals. Yeah. We're going to give you a different fuel source here. So mm-hmm. little tweaks are actually very beneficial because mm-hmm. if we, we don't have the week to look forward to, but we have, yeah. let's say, another 100 days, yeah. we can take that information and saying, you're going to start depleting all your stores, yeah. so we're going to take you through the next 100 days and we're going to show you how to do that. Oh, okay, that makes right? sense, yeah. So you can't store anything because you're depleting yourself every single day. Right. Yeah. So we have to give you food, food mm-hmm. and fuel that you're going to take in yeah. and, and, and burn, take in and burn. And so those kinds of, so you're taking in my group sessions and in my team, I'm looking at three days in something like what Skylar was doing. I'm looking at a hundred days, but uh, it's daily. Yeah. So there is no time to repair. So the treatments in essence are okay. Uh, I'm going to remove lactic acid and inflammation from the sites. So when we saw Skylar, we did full body. Mm -hmm. He sat in a cold tub first. We removed all the inflammation, um, brought his temperature down. Then we looked at the sites that, so you do a lot of global things. Yeah. Flushing of the body, that kind of thing, right? So, yeah. So it's just bigger projects, but you can't influence little sites because you're going to make them sore. Hmm. Yeah, very different treatment uh, strategies for hmm. something that's, you know, um, they, they train and they taper themselves yeah. and their coaches know what day they're going to bag skate and what day they're going to, you know, they're going to recover yeah. day and they're going to go in the gym and then they got a yoga day and they got a stretching day. Those are very, very different than I'm going to run a marathon and a half every single day for X number of days. Yeah, there's a different challenge there. Yes. For sure. Now... Does that help having when you see clients like that and it's so different from whether it be elite level hockey players or football players, basketball players mm-hmm. to guys like Skylar, for example, yeah. or people like Skylar, for example, doing those crazy feats, like you said, marathon and a half yeah. every single day for yeah. about half a year. Yeah. Ridiculous. So how helpful is that having like a team team to do that? Like just uh-huh. boom, this is where we go. This is like the HQ yeah. of getting recovery and prevent my injuries. This is where I go. We go see Kim and her and the team, they take care of it. Like how nice is that? It's, to, it's critical because yeah. I graduated from school 21 years ago. So, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So things have changed. And, and so I've got, of course, I'm the oldest one in the facility. So then I've got, you know, a fascial stretching therapist like yeah. Mike who um, has a really cool vibe and um, yeah. his knowledge yeah. base is, is different than mine, right? right? Um, and then you've got physio who has a little bit more evidence-based material. And so having a collection of people with different experiences and different educations is actually pretty cool because mm-hmm. if I can't figure it out or it's like, okay, we've got this guy or this girl and she's doing A, B, and C. Um, we've got, we're going to see them for a day and a half and then they're gone again or whatever it might be. You can take all those heads and we do like what, what like rounds like physicians do. Yep. And you get together and say, okay, how are we going to tackle these issues with the time we have, yep. knowing that they're coming out of here and they're going to do this, whatever is coming up. And, um, and then we can sit down and figure out the plan so mm-hmm. it's not it's not one it's not on one person's shoulders right, where you're right or wrong probably nice right yeah for sure um two it's not only on one person's experiences because yeah. before before the 
I'd say before probably even like maybe 2015 and later the, the Spartan races existed probably, but they weren't really well known. It's yeah, so only in the last, well. let's say, five to seven years where mm -hmm. you've got these extreme, these regular people doing extreme things. Yeah. Right? So when you have a, a high level athlete doing something extreme, well, their body's prepared for that. Yeah. When you take an everyday person who sits at a desk and then all of a sudden they're going to do 21 kilometers and 60 obstacles, that's not a normal transition. No, it's kind of outrageous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's where the team approach, you know, is it's always, always, always better. Now, yeah. thankfully, the team approach is only as good as your pieces right. and only as good as your relationships. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I definitely believe that the team approach is better than one. Amazing. So I get a sense that you're very, very big on community, whether that be in your... I am. Right? I love my community. Amazing. Whether that be yeah. in like your own group at the at Active Therapy Plus, yep. Yep. or whether that's in the community of Sudbury. Right. Right. So, with that transitioning a bit, um, what are some activities or community involvement groups that you do? Like, tell um, me about that. Yeah, I love my community. Nice. They they grew me and they feed me, right? So, yeah, that's right. Um, so I am a Rotarian, mm -hmm. very proud one. I'm part of the Sunrisers. And uh, the nice thing about Rotary is it's a group of, um, it's a good network. They're, they're like-minded. They're mm. usually business owners or healthcare providers. Yeah. And we do a lot of great things in the community. Um, there's Rotary Park. Um, all the way down, if you follow Rotary, um, they're also in the process of eradicating polio. So they do things worldwide. So they're, almost every community yeah. has a Rotary program. Um, so, okay. yeah, yeah. So we, we do Vive Le Vain. We do the lobster um, dinner at, at um, and that's the other group. But there's two groups of Rotary in town. Mm. Um, so I do that, and that's at a, a slightly bigger level. And then um, I try to kind of go with what's happening in the community. So mm. anytime one of our local athletes do something like Cacciati mm. or Matt, um, I jump in on those things yeah. to, to push that. Um, when COVID hit, I, like most people, was like, okay, now what do I do for a few weeks? Uh. <laughs> so I started something called the RVs for healthcare workers mm -hmm. with a friend of mine. And what we did was because the um, campgrounds were closed yeah. and a lot of our frontline workers were scared to go home because we didn't know anything about COVID. Yeah. Um, so I reached out in my community and every time I do, they come come at me Amazing. with arms wide open. Amazing. And we yeah. had Jim's portable toilets. We had Dr. Clean. We had Jerry Lougheed. We had Everybody you can imagine, Nickel City, yes. um, uh, Nickel Belt Camping, everybody. Oh, yeah. And what they did was, even Vince Palladino gave me brand new RVs Epic. to park in healthcare workers' driveways. Even our Amazing. city of Sudbury yeah. gave us an extension on the bylaw of being able to park an RV. Come on. Yeah, yeah. No, everybody just said, yep, you know what? Let's do this. So what they did was they allowed us to keep our healthcare workers safe from their families. Yeah. They could do one of these out the window, yeah. but before we knew how contagious and how Jeez. dangerous COVID was, community stepped up. <sighs> That's right? amazing. Sudbury, you know, could I do this in a bigger community? Can I do this in a different community? I don't like, know. Maybe. 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 But yeah. um, I'll, I'll tell you, the Sudbury <laughs> community for backing one of its own yeah. um, is, is insane. It's it's a, it's an amazing community. Every time I've reached out for, um, for example, um, uh, in the past, Derek uh, McKenzie mm -hmm. would run an NHL golf tournament. And amazing. that golf tournament would raise money for the NOFCC, right. which is the families with children with cancer. Yeah. Okay. And a couple years ago, um, I was chatting with him, and because he's now a coach in the NHL, he yeah. doesn't get his summers off. And this is a big undertaking. This is a big golf uh. tournament. And so I said, okay, I'll take it. Yeah. And he's like, one problem. I'm like, what? He's like, you don't play in the NHL. Yeah. Ah! Yeah, I'll I, figure ah, it out. That's okay. <laughs> that's just a small problem. That's he's a like, me problem. We'll okay, sure, Kim. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, Tyler Bertuzzi uh, was in the clinic. And, you know, I said, Ty, you want to you wanna do this for me? And he's like, sure. I don't have to talk, do I? I'm like, no, no, I don't have to talk. I just need someone to be yeah, in the yeah, NHL. I don't have to talk. To and that's just funny. like that, Within months, Tyler became um, 
this community icon and he helped me with everything we yeah. needed. Now, unfortunately, COVID hit in 2020, so we yeah. couldn't do his um, his first golf tournament. So what we did instead was we sold face masks of Tyler Bacchusi's right. smile. Yeah. And, you know, I said, I'm going to sell $10,000 with masks. And Amazing. everybody thought it was nuts. And um, so I and I, I didn't sell them cheap. They were $70 a mask. Mm -hmm. So they were expensive. <laughs> and again, I went to Smith's Markets. I went to Cocoon Hardware, Belanger Ford. Yeah. I was I went to see um, Laking Toyota. Yeah, and everybody. Everybody. Yeah. And I sold out of masks and we made $10,000 nice. for cool. the NOFCC. That's amazing. Right? So amazing. it's... Um, yeah. You know, and again, it's an ugly smile. I love you, Tyler, but it's a nice <laughs> smile. And uh, it's you know, missing half there, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, so it's you know, it's it's any time somebody here has needed something, um, whatever mm. it was. Uh, this community is a pretty special place. There's no doubt. So we've been <clears> in COVID <throat> for what, about two years now. Pretty close, yeah. Close. Hey, oh yeah. Just shy of, but yeah. 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 So what? Um, I was talking to a paramedic who I had on uh, last episode, Matt, yep. love yep. the guy. He, him and I kind of after the episode started talking about a community and stuff like that. And he made an interesting point. I'm curious about your perspective on it, but okay. how has the community changed from the beginning of COVID and the whole pandemic to where we are now? That could be at a global mm -hmm. scale, a provincial, mm -hmm. federal, whatever it is, but mm -hmm. we'll focus at just the municipal level, but okay. how has it changed in your eyes? Going back to that RV initiative and everybody was, you know, pooling together and pooling resources and there were challenges out on Facebook and mm. there were GoFundMe pages and yeah. there was a whole, so much uh, community where, you know, people were posting on Facebook to just, you know, buy your spa gift certificates, go out and order food. And there was this huge connection. And unfortunately, I think the vaccine passports um has broken us a little yeah, bit created a divide. yeah there's a there's a there's a divide and mm -hmm. now i do see that on facebook i see people who yeah. post um things about rights and and the jab and all this other stuff and yeah it's unfortunate and i don't i don't disagree and i don't agree um i'm in the healthcare field and i had yeah. to do what was right for me and my family but um i i th don't think we're as connected and I don't think we're as strong as a community mm -hmm. as we were in March, April, May of 2020. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, I, I, I think we'll get back there again. I hope so. Um, I think once they start alleviating and, and, and you know, taking down some of these restrictions, mm -hmm. but I think it's going to, I think for some, it's going to last a little longer than that. Yeah. I think within family circles, within business circles, within um, medical circles where, you know, maybe you were denied care, not care, but they denied entry into a restaurant or being able to see your son play hockey. Yeah. Um, I think that's going to leave a mark. I think, so. I think it's going to take us a little bit of time to heal as a community mm -hmm. as, and that's every community. That's just not right, Sudbury. Right, that's not just Sudbury, right? Um, but sure. I, I, I think we're going to feel that for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think so. <clears throat> and I'm grateful that I'm in healthcare so I didn't have to, you know, pull that punch. Um, yeah. I, I know obviously a lot of businesses had to, mm. and uh, that was the only way they could stay open. Right. But, you know, it's still tough. Yeah, and I think that's, I think you said it though, um, and I find a lot of people are doing just that, or expressing some form of gratitude throughout mm -hmm. the whole thing, mm -hmm. where it's, look, I know we're all going through it, whether yeah. it be different, in different ways or not, right? Whether it be yeah. you're out for six months or not, right? Yeah. But I think the ability to be grateful or find things to be grateful for in a time like this we'll call it yep is severely overlooked yes. and we're kind of getting away from that like at yes. the beginning <clears throat> it was like hey you know i'm doing workouts with friends on instagram like just well even the hearts things, in the windows right? and the and the chalk yeah. drawings along the sidewalks <sighs> and the drive-by birthdays the drive-by like, birthdays they uh, were not what you wanted no but they showed such a connection and a mm -hmm. unity and uh made we, the most of a bad we situation. did we have lost that a little bit yeah yeah I mean, uh, yeah now we just kind of whatever we're gonna all go <clears throat> or we're just not gonna bother so yeah. it's, we've it's got that like, interaction written. again that one-on-one -on -one person contact yeah, which is nice which is nice yeah. and everybody needs and thrives on yeah um but some of the creativity and the other pieces would have been nice to see a little longer yeah i think so and it was it was cool but i can 
I cannot, for the life of me, go back to doing Zoom podcast, Kim. No, no, I can't no, do me it. neither. I can't do it, right? Any, yeah. like, interactions with yeah. other clients yeah, yeah. or with other people, it's like, hey, so... I hear you. It's good and it's not, but the anxiety going on in my head every single time I hit record or I open up a Zoom chat with a, a guest and they're from, like, they're an actor and they're in Halifax. And I'm yeah. like, all right, here we go. You know, we figured out the time difference, everything, and now the connection ship. I'm like, uh, but they're like, well, it's your Wi-Fi. And I'm like, but mine, like my mom teaches on the thing. Like she's, just, yeah. it's fine for her. It should be fine for this. You know? Yeah. So then you're arguing yeah. kind of. Yeah. yeah. And so it's, yeah, for the life of me, I'm, I'll fly somewhere to do a podcast yeah. before I. Yeah. No, I hear you. I'm grateful Zoom for that as well. Yeah. It was nice, but then I got over it quickly and yeah. now we're, uh, now we're here. Yeah. But switching a bit of gears, are you. Do you practice Chinese medicine at all, or have you studied it? Yeah, I, I, uh, I do. I am part of the College of Traditional Chinese Medicine Practitioners and Acupuncturists of Ontario. Nice. CTCMPAO. It's a really, it's I'm a, very impressed. It's a big, yeah, big mouthful. Yeah. Um, so I did my acupuncture. I completed it in twenty and two thousand, mm -hmm. and in twenty thirteen they regulated acupuncture, which was the thing to do because we are breaking the surface of the skin. Yeah. Um, and then what they did was they allowed us to write a series of exams. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you pass them, then they would grandfather you in to yeah. this Chinese medicine piece. Um, but when oh. I took my acupuncture, I just took acupuncture. Yeah. I didn't take traditional Chinese medicine. Oh. Right? Yeah. But the college is all of it. So it's the herbs. It's the, the diagnosing of the pulses and, and the tongue. And Whoa. so it's, 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 a, it's a very deep, it, it's a whole practice. Yeah. Right? Um, it, and it's very, very different from Western, obviously. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, I took a little bit of studying and uh, yes. et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, so I I, I did uh, I was able to keep my acupuncture license, and I it's a big part of what I do actually. Not yeah. not the traditional Chinese methods, the acupuncture. What's an example of a traditional uh, Chinese method of healing? Um, so they so traditionally they work in meridians. Okay. Right. So their belief system runs that. Um, every ailment mm -hmm. is either an excess or deficiency. There's a there's a problem within that meridian. So we've got lung, okay. kidney, heart, right? Yeah. So and if you've ever seen one of those anatomical drawings with the yeah. meridians, you'll see the little dots and the lines that kind of run up. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, so I know what you're talking about. They yeah. all connect. So when oh. you look up, say someone comes to you and they're having trouble with fertility. Oh, well, yeah. there is a protocol or there's series of protocols mm -hmm. and there's also laws yeah. so if one way doesn't work you can work off of a different law so it's actually it's very very interesting stuff Whoa. and then they give you the points and you, sometimes you're simulating yeah. sometimes you're dampening and so you're working on oh. what might be blocking oh that's cool right so really neat stuff so fertility is a big one yeah. um um, and they work in like dampness and colds and, and, uh, so what their lungs are doing, what their pulses are doing. And, uh, yeah, oh. so it's, it's very different from, yeah. we say it's different, but when I went to write the exam, yeah. um, so, you know, in terms of heat, mm -hmm. right, they say, okay, well, there's a lot of heat in you. Well, that to us, that's inflammation. So it's not that different. It's just the language is different. Right, and then oh, when wow. you look at you know um, dampness, well, dampness could be something from an infection to huh. um, arthritis to right. So think about being in a damp corner for a little bit. What? what how would you feel? Right. Yeah. So we think of them very differently. Like a chill feel. Yeah, yeah but. You can actually Whoa. under if you understand what they're describing from thousands and thousands and thousands of years yeah. ago, all our medicine typically matches. Whoa, it's just some form of West it's like westernized. <laughs> it's just westernized. Some... Yep. Whoa. Yeah. That's so cool. So yeah, it gives Jeez. me it just gives me another trick in my toolbox, right? Yeah, you don't say. That's yeah. something that hey, because I I knew I wanted to ask you about it, but I yeah. had no idea. So like, yeah. Oh, this... yeah. Interesting. Wow. So what, um, what kind of mentorship programs do you do or are you part of? So um, I take on students. I have any given time anywhere from five to ten students, mm -hmm. uh, primarily university, a yeah. lot, of, lot of Laurentian. Um, we take on at the clinic, we take physiotherapy students, we take on medical students. Um, and then we take on, I'll take on a couple high school students. 
um, just you know so they can do a co-op. We mentor through, uh, so we mentor the student trainers at Laurentian University. Mm -hmm. um, we mentor, we're looking at perhaps starting a mentorship kind of with our Sudbury Wolves mm -hmm. and yeah. maybe either via um, our community or them through the NHL. So we, mm -hmm. we do, I do quite a few mentorship type programs. I take on a lot of students. Anybody yeah. that wants to come in, come on in. Ah, oh, that's cool. What, <clears throat> I feel it's such an important thing for somebody in a high school student role to do or even yep. a post-secondary yeah like having that co-op experience i didn't have it until the last second last semester of my uh my schooling and i did it after kind of halfway through it i was like i don't really know if i want to do this mm -hmm. type of like be in this type of environment all the time <clears throat> yeah so everybody stops moving at 4 30 there's I, it was it was really weird, Kim. I was sitting in this in this like city of Ottawa building. It was like the thirteenth floor of this okay. fifty story building. Okay, I'm sitting down. It's Friday. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm like, all right, you know, it's Friday. Let's go. This is awesome, right? This is what we all the best day of the Absolutely. week. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So I'm sitting there and I look and I have a timer that goes off at five, right? Yeah. So my timer went off at five, and as soon as it went, all I heard was just everybody in the office deep breath out. And everybody stood up. It oh, was the wow. most ridiculous, like cattle herding. <laughs> yep. And then thing of all time. Oh yeah. Right. And then just everybody yeah. fell in line. Yeah. Hey, have a good weekend. Have a good weekend. And yeah. First thing, first thing happens on Monday. Everybody sits down. Just coffee. There's a lineup at the Keurig. People mm -hmm. are storing in. Mm -hmm. Sit down and go. And then it's yeah. Noon hits. Oh like, yeah. Oh, Robotic. No. Eh? Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. That kind of made me go, you know, I'm going to figure out something different. So I'm grateful for where I am now, but that learning experience is huge. And I think it's cool that you're giving people a chance to do that yeah. and understand kind of what's to expect in the industry. Yeah. So. And I, and I like to teach, you know, so, yeah. and my, my, it's always, a, it's also a good environment for your patients because they're listening to you. So they take a little bit more about what's going on in them yeah. because you explain it differently for the student. You explain it to them. Mm -hmm. But you might give a little bit more detail in the explanation to the kin student or the med student or the physio student. And so you're talking about them longer. They take in more information, right? And you're talking yeah. about the modality, saying, okay, this is what ultrasound does. Mm -hmm. This is what we're going to do it for. And they're taking that information. Because yeah. I wouldn't have necessarily told them that. Right, but it almost gives right? them a confidence. Absolutely. In the, oh, they know this and, shit. And people yeah. are, you know, generally speaking, people are really good in, in educational surroundings. Yeah. Um, you know, I know everyone has a little bit of a issue with the doctor coming in being a student, but your doctor started that way too. And yeah. uh, a learning environment is, 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 a, is just critical. Right. You, you, you got, you got to go through it. So, yeah. um, yeah, so I, I, I love to talk obviously, and I love to teach. So, um, having a learning facility is, is, uh, one of the things I think that makes, um, our environment is as positive as it is because we're always talking. The students are yeah, always no asking kidding. questions. So then the patient is learning. Uh, <clears throat> I think that's something uh, that's so fascinating. I just think the ability to have that growth mindset and being around, even if you're maybe not so much, that's your style, your yeah. personality, yeah. but being around that, right? Like yeah. who you're around is so huge. Yeah. And who impacts you and who has influence in your decisions and stuff is very, very crucial especially maybe not so much as we go as we grow older but yeah. very much in the beginning stages of yeah. our lives right yeah for sure like we all want to make decisions we all want to choose the right path but we don't actually nobody really knows what they're oh, doing oh no they right? don't we're just all really good at making it seem like we know what we're doing <laughs> yep so <laughs> it's like everybody figured this out by failing a couple million times anyway yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. like ah uh, you make mistakes or whatever it happens but do you have that you're able to share with us um a kind of learning opportunity or like a big moment that experience you had that taught you a lot it could be at the beginning stages of practice or recently anything. i had a lot of so um shortly after i opened the clinic i had an opportunity to speak to go back to sheridan and speak cool. and one of the very first questions asked to me and i'll never forget him he said weren't you nervous about opening your facility, like opening a clinic? Cause yeah. I never worked for anybody. I, I, 
I only ever really worked in the school clinic. Um, and then you were with sports teams because I'm a sports therapist. Right. So most of our, um, our like internships were with teams, not in clinic settings. No. I wanted to be a clinician yeah. and I wanted to work on teams, but I didn't want my primary role to be on the field. Right. Right. And I remember standing up in front of this class going, oh, shit, I probably should have been. But then it was like this epiphany going, huh. No, actually, I wasn't nervous. Um, no, I wasn't scared. Oh, shit, I should have been, you know. Like, uh... And it was kind of like this wave came over me and I went, ew. And, you know, everybody in the clinic um, would, you know, I come in on Monday yeah. with a certain look on my face and they all look at me and go, what would you get us into this weekend, right? Because I come in with, we're opening another facility, or we're I'm writing a book, or yeah. you know we're doing this for this team, or da da da. And so they're all Monday morning, they're waiting for, okay, what are we doing now? All right. Um, yeah. So I don't know if there was a a moment or um, anything that I went through that. Um, I can't think of one except that um, every time I've, I'm always so grateful mm -hmm. for the relationships and, and what it's allowed me to do. And every time I succeed at something like yeah. writing the book or, you know, um, getting the valet contract or opening another location or, you know, you sit back and you reflect and go, okay, what did I do right? Mm -hmm to allow these other people or, or these, these um, experiences and opportunities to fall into my lap. Mm -hmm. And I learned that way, but it's a little reverse than oh, what most okay. people would expect. There's not usually that something that I learned from. Right. It's usually, oh shit, I did that. Oh, oh, maybe I should, you know? And, yeah. and then it's, it's kind of, I, I kind of flip it where um, I'm grateful it happened, but I'm, I'm pretty, I, I'm just, I'm so driven mm -hmm. that I, I don't really need them. I don't right. know if that sounds... No, it makes a lot of sense. You, sense. you don't need a big, like, bad thing to happen for you yeah. to learn from to pick yourself up and move forward yeah. or move, keep going. No. Yeah. Yeah, I think that pays a lot of, like you said, um, that could probably be attributed to, <clears throat> excuse me, the people that you're around at those times and just your ability to take from experiences that's yeah happened mm -hmm. right not Absolutely. so much these ridiculously bad ones because everybody learns differently and everybody mm -hmm. grows differently right yeah. whether you yeah. had a big fail or not it's not really a yeah big deal so yeah and you know there's you know like it's and it's not like i've gone after everything and gotten everything mm -hmm. um but yeah you, you learn from those those issues and sometimes it was you know a practitioner chose to leave yeah. well that's a loss because they're my friends and they're mm -hmm. my coworkers, and i consider them family but i've always told everybody that comes to work with me not for me but with me mm -hmm. that if an opportunity is better elsewhere you need to take it yeah i'm not going to sign you to a contract because everybody needs to walk into work and have it feel like i get to you every day and if that's not reciprocated yeah. for you and working here or going on this team or moving is that environment for you, then you need to take it. Mm -hmm. Right? So you learn from those, but they're not they're not necessarily mistakes or anything you did wrong. It's just somebody right. needs to grow somewhere else or something needs to happen, you know, for you to grow. Yeah. But there really was never I can't think of, and I could be wrong, but I can't think of a situation or something that's happened that um either derailed me or gave me the direction. I, I'm such a, that's great. a linear thought <laughs> right process, on. right? That yeah. I just keep trucking. Doing, that's great. Yeah. That's awesome. <clears throat> so you touched on it briefly. Um, okay. And if you're okay with discuss it, at least, at least briefly discuss sure. it. Um, tell me about this book you're writing. Okay. So I teach a lot. I mm -hmm. teach at the med school. Um, I have students, like I said, you know, any given time there's five plus students in the facility. So I spend, as I'm treating, I'm spending my day teaching. Mm -hmm. And one of my new athletic therapists, Isabel, um, and in the past I've been told, you need to come and lecture at this school and you need to come teach my class or I wish I had you as a teacher because this would have made so much more sense. Yeah. Or I learn more like this than I did there. And, you know, the thing is, like, hey, I can't, I can't 
go and lecture. I can't just yeah. go and do all these things. I gotta come practice too. That's yeah. Right. Yeah, for sure. And I can't just walk in yeah. in front of your teacher and start, you know, teaching the class. <laughs> so Isabel says to me, Well, why don't you just re write a book? And I went, Light bulb. Oh, you're right. I'm gonna do it. And I literally started that day. Amazing. So I opened up. Yeah. Like a do a tang kind of book, awesome. and I wrote started writing down the things that I did differently than others um, that I would consider specializing in, in the sense that yeah. doctors and other practitioners refer to me for. Um, and voila, I had fifteen chapters, wow. and um, and then I started you know talking to patients about putting a li like their little case study in kind yeah. of thing, and oh that's cool yeah. And then I started looking for publishers, and I found um, Tell Well in BC, which I, I uh, happen to really enjoy working with. Nice. And then all of a sudden, it was like, okay, this is... So what I'm... Ideally, what I'm doing is creating... And it's not a very large book, but it's a resource. Yeah. So it's a reference book for yeah. new practitioners or, or newer practitioners. And what I find in schooling is there's just so much out there, and, and the body is so gray... And there's so many variables that when they teach you, they have to teach you a very black and white. Sprains, yeah. strains, discs, da 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 yeah, da so fractures. Much more than that. Yeah. And you you put age and you put repetitive things and you put postures in there and you put ethnic backgrounds and you you all of a sudden it's not black and white. No. And the problem is is that they teach you something called differential diagnosis. So when you go to do your tests and, and when you're you're in school, they'll say, well, I think it's uh, lateral epicondylitis. And then they'll say, okay, and what's your differential diagnosis? And what that means is, what else could it be? Yeah. Problem is, is it's still very a black and a yeah, white it answer. Could be anything, because I'm sure you could justify it sure. being, yeah. So you're going to say, it's a strain of the brachioradialis. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a good, that's possible. You're right. And that's how you leave school. So it's like, okay, so I've got the what I think it is, what tests positive clinically, and then I have an idea of what it might Whoa. be. But what the differential diagnosis means is that, okay, but it's probably not something that similar. No. But what we don't do is we don't dive back into things that we taught we were taught very briefly. Yeah. And in my twenty one years of experience in the chronic pain uh, and sporting world, um, I found that the things that I never thought about actually ended up being the majority of my diagnosis oh wow so the real obscure out there yeah. um, didn't even know that could happen in that site issues and that's why a lot of my referrals they say mm. if Kim can't figure it out nobody can and that's not because yeah. I've reinvented the wheel no all I've done is gone back and went what were those obscure things that they s never really spent time teaching yeah. us because those are what I'm seeing more of. Oh, wow. So that's what I'm writing the book at. It's almost like a reminder really or a cool. refresher. Mm -hmm. Don't forget these things, yeah. right? Don't forget about these ones that these tissues exist, one that these tissues can be injured or inflamed, yeah. and one that you need to investigate these possibilities. Yeah. And if you do, you'll be more successful. Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. really cool. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, so I'm love enjoying that. it. You know, yeah. I'm... It uh, takes up some time, but it's also making me stronger again. Because every time you learn something or you relearn something, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you're still better at what you do. If right. you don't open a book for 20 years, things have changed and you are going to forget oh, yeah. other things. And then Very we end up so. back to patterns. We end up in these, these loops where everything's the disc, everything in the shoulder is rotator cuff, everything da-da-da-da, mm -hmm. and you kind of forget that there is hundreds of other possibilities yeah. so doing something like writing a book 21 years later mm -hmm. um, allows me to go back and remember some of those grassroots yeah. and now also I find doing that would also <clears throat> you can see what might have changed or what mm -hmm. has stood the test of time yeah right. well and what I see clinically over and over and over yeah. again which they don't prepare you for Really? Right? Something so, you see every day. That absolutely. There's things wow. where there isn't even really a clinical test for. You can only feel it with your hands. Oh, so it's like, I've got these nodules in the back, and you keep finding these nodules. Like, And someone will say, well, it's a lipoma. Somebody else says it's a, it's a, a fascial bundle. And somebody mm. else says, you know, uh, irregular tissue. And you're like, yeah. well, I can't cut the guy open to find out what it actually is. So, 
you know, but yeah. I'm seeing 90% of my back patients with this thing. So then you figure out, okay, so I found a pattern. I treat it, that pattern works. Mm -hmm. So then you got to go back and go, what the hell are these things? Right? And you start going <laughs> yeah. through and you find out, well, this is what they're called. This is what they do. Oh, that's bad. You know? And then all of a sudden you've got a chapter. Amazing. Yeah. Ah, oh, that sounds so fun though. It sounds like you're really enjoying the process. Oh, I, too. It, I am. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That's really cool. When, uh, when that's kind of finished and it's done and you've done your, uh, or, and you go on your book tour or whatever, I'll have to yeah. have you on the show to go way more into it and we'll I go through and go, yeah. do, like, do a read or yeah. something. Yeah. Cause I definitely love a uh, buy a copy. That's, uh, yeah. that's very yeah. intriguing. Yeah. And then it, you know, it'll go out to, it'll be on Amazon. It'll be on all the, nice. so you'll be able to get an E version. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, so yeah. then it'll be hard copy as well. So nice. it'll be, it'll be out there. There's something when it comes to, I found lately reading hard copies. Yeah. I know people like as a form of learning that we talked about briefly, yeah. right? With in, the access to information is huge, right? Mm -hmm. But there's so many different ways. Like, there's so many different podcasts about anything and everything, yeah. right? Yeah. From world history to business. And it's awesome, right? How accessible everything is. But I almost yeah. feel like there's, it, there's almost too much. Like it's very, very, very crowded. Very hard to navigate. Very to. tricky, yeah. right? And yeah. so I almost find like I grab it. I go towards people that I'm like, okay, I like what you're doing in this industry yeah. and I have one or two that I kind of stick with in each industry, whether it be yeah. martial arts, business, like woodworking and woodcrafting sure. stuff, sure. right? Whatever yeah. hobbies we all have, yeah. we kind of yeah. find one or two, focus on yeah. those. But um, with that, do you have kind of a, um, like what's your favorite experience working like at your, like as in your job, let's say, because I think the whole word of job is I, convoluted. I, I think my best experiences are giving, will be giving people hope, yeah. giving them answers, giving them a direction. Um, and so I think just being able to help people because, you yeah. know, when you're in chronic pain and I mean, my sports, my athletes are obviously family to me and, and, mm -hmm. I, and I love them dearly, but um, they're going to be okay, right? So if one of my NHL players or one of my OHL players or one of my pro, you know, basketball players roll an ankle, they're going to be okay. So is it a cool experience to work with them? 100%. Probably, yeah. But the biggest satisfaction is taking somebody who's had chronic pain for two or three decades, been to everybody, done everything, doesn't have a clue what's going on. No hope in it. No yeah. hope. And then I see them. I know what it is. I can fix it. Or at least I can influence it. Mm -hmm. and you know and then they give me a hug or I get this yeah. message saying you know thank you for changing my life or thank wow. you for giving me my life back That's amazing. Um, those are the those are the things that I cherish yeah. the most like I've got a really really cool job yeah and at face value obviously the stuff with I the pros and and the actors and and doing those things those look like the coolest parts but in essence, the coolest parts is working on the average everyday human mm -hmm. that has nowhere to turn and haven't ha hasn't had yeah. any help or the help hasn't helped and and being able to influence their recovery. Mm -hmm. Wow, <clears throat> I love that. That's really cool. Yeah, that's a really cool way of. Uh... Wow, that's a really good way of looking at it. Right. Um, so as we kind of wrap up, mm -hmm. um, do you have any? We went through a lot of different things. Do you have any? thing that you would like to pass on or any final message or experience or lesson you'd like to share with everybody just so that yep. uh i do um going back to the intro where i talked you know about everybody in high school mm -hmm. and having this direction i can tell you that probably 98 percent of those people never went into the right direction they went into so have you know so taking that and making it an insecurity or an uncertainty yeah. for yourself because, oh my God, I don't know what I want to do, isn't the wrong direction. No. Right? And there's so many jobs and so many professions and so many careers out there um, that you don't even, not knowing in the moment doesn't mean anything. Right. Okay. And when I, took my, uh, when I took my first class in osteopathy with mm. this doctor, world-renowned Dr. Guy Voyer, he had everybody put their hands on, on each other. And he explained this figure eight type movement that existed in the body mm 
Mm -hmm. And so, and I'm good with my hands. So I'm sitting there and I've got my hands on this person. I'm trying to feel, and he's like, there's, you're going to feel the body's respiration. You're mm -hmm. going to feel the body's blood flow and heart rate. Mm -hmm. This is a different movement. You have to feel this movement. Okay, here I go. And I'm doing one of these going, Does anybody, anybody feel this shit? I don't feel a thing. <laughs> and of course, person's like, oh, I feel this. And someone else is like, oh, I feel it too. And I'm sitting there going, oh my God, I, I can't be an osteopath. I, I can't feel a thing. Like, I can't feel a thing. So, okay, I'll do this again. And I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm like, I'm going to fail. Like, this guy's not going to take me. And what I learned in that moment, he stood up and said, you, you, and you, almost like the new Amsterdam show, you, you, and you, you're out of the class. It wasn't me he was pointing to. He said, you're too suggestive. I gave you something to feel for that doesn't exist. And you Whoa. all did what you thought I wanted you to do, which means that you're not actually going to feel what exists in the body because I told you what to look for and you told me you found it and it doesn't exist. And he only kept five of us. And because we're all like, oh shit, we're in trouble. Like we're not going to be able to stay in this course only because we were truthful and we were humble and we really couldn't feel a damn it's thing. It's okay not to know. It's okay not to know. Wow. And that was damn, something I've, yeah, I've carried all along. What? It's okay not to have an answer. Yeah. The worst thing to do is fake it or lie about it or, you know what I mean? Yeah. And you know what? I've done that in my own physical clinic. I've said, listen, I don't know what this is. I think, I, I think it's this. Mm -hmm. But let's get a second opinion. So going back to that lesson, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you don't know. And most times, mm -hmm. you're going to know eventually, right? Yeah. So whether it's your profession, whether it's your soulmate, whether it's, you know, whatever path your life is going to take. Am I going to stay in Sudbury? Am I going to end up somewhere yeah. else in the world? You just have to breathe. There will be a sign. There'll be a signal. Mm -hmm. There'll be something that comes across you know, and, and you embark in that journey when it comes. But the one thing, do not stress if you do not know. There's a reason you don't know. And in that time, mm -hmm. your body, you, yourself, whatever your environment, you're not ready to know the answer. Wow. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Now, um, do you have anywhere, where can people reach you or where can people <laughs> find you? Where yep. can people get treated or prevent their injuries? Yeah, so... Uh, the one location that I'm working primarily out of is called Active Therapy. Um, the funny thing is the building doesn't say Active Therapy on it. It no, says I've the clinic that needs no name. And <laughs> the, the reason behind that is, is when I, it's amazing. the owner owned three buildings in a row yeah. and mine is the middle building. Mm -hmm. So when the owner got the percentage of signage, you're only allowed so much percentage of, of, of your building being uh, covered by a sign. That makes sense. So yeah. all that percentage was allocated to one of the buildings, not mine. So when I went to get a permit to get a sign in the building, I, was, I wasn't approved. So I went back to the sign company and said, I need something to tell people where I am. Can I put a sentence up? And he's like, ah, I guess so, as long as it's not a sign. I'm like, okay. So we literally put the clinic that needs no name and it had a dual, a dual <laughs> purpose because most people don't know my clinic name anyway. They just say, go see Kim. Yeah. So it was a clinic fair. that didn't need a name, but mm. it was also a clinic that didn't get a name because it wasn't allowed a sign. <laughs> so, you know, years later now, I can definitely put a sign up, but I've chosen to keep it. I like it, yeah. Go it's kind of quirky, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's 797 Lauren Street. Um, I, end, I am opening a second location in New Sudbury, so that's oh, some, nice. some exciting stuff we'll chat about another day. Yeah, Thank for you. Sure, for sure. Um, so we will have a second location, but for now, um, if you look up Active Therapy Plus, uh, the phone number is 674-2222, so nice and easy. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's we're a multidisciplinary clinic with three athletic therapists, three physiotherapists, three massage therapists. We have a nutritionist, a doctor of naturopathic medicine, uh, two fascial stretching therapists, I think that's it. So nice. um, yeah, so uh, we've got we've got it all basically, yeah. and uh, and and we are really good. If it, if somebody needs something that isn't under our roof, we have a great referral source. We work with concussions. Um, we work with all athletes. Obviously, we do chronic care and chronic pain. And um, yeah, right on, Kim. I'm super grateful for your time. Thank and you. And we were able to chat. I learned a lot, and I hope everybody else did too. And thank um, you. Yeah, I look forward to chatting with you again in the future. Sounds so thank good, you very man. Much. Right thank on. you. Happy right Sunday, on. everybody. Right on.